Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's shop talk, the first uh, of uh, the new year. My name is Peter Miller. I'm the Andrew High School Arts Director at the American Academy in Rome. And tonight, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Fu Huang and Rasheli Rotem, the joint recipients of the Founders Rome Prize in Architecture uh, this year at the Academy. Together, uh, they are the founders and directors of Modu, an architecture practice specializing in design that connects people to their environment, exploring the boundaries between architecture and weather. Fu received his uh, master in architecture at Columbia and his bachelor of science at the Georgia Institute of Technology. And Rochelle obtained her master of science in advanced architectural design at Columbia and her bachelor of architecture uh, summa cum laude at Technion, the Israel Institute of Technology. Fu is currently uh, also adjunct assistant professor at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, and previously he taught at the University of Pennsylvania at the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Historic Preservation. Rochelle has had several teaching appointments, including that of visiting professor at the graduate program in the School of Art and Design at Pratt Institute. Uh, they have done impressive work as individuals, but, uh, uh, and racking up a, a, a list of awards and honors, which I, I won't enumerate, but it's very impressive. Uh, but it's working together as Modu that their design work has acquired its distinctive character and its particular focus on the relationship between architecture and weather. Their work has won uh, design awards and competitions, uh, from, among others, the American Institute of Architects, the Architectural League of New York, Creative Time, and uh, World Architectural News. In Rome, uh, they are conducting research about the thermodynamic characters of Rome's piazzas and, and public spaces, how the cooler winter weather, uh, for example, and low sun angles at this time of year uh, condition the social interaction of people passing through or gathering uh, in these uh, public uh, venues. They are also exploring Italy's contemporary ruins, unfinished projects in various states of uh, what they call, quote, weather modification. In fact, according to the Ministero delle Infrastrutture e dei Trasporti under the Mario Monti administration a few years ago, uh, uh, in 2014, in fact, which compiled a list of incomplete works in diverse except Trentino, which claims to have none. <laughs> there are more than 600 unfinished public works in this country. One of the most dramatic examples of that is uh, something we can see from the uh, roof of this building, the roof terrace, is that of the Cittadella dello Sport di Tor Vergata, a project conceived for the 2009 uh, World Swimming Championships uh, with a master plan by Spanish architect Santiago Calatrava. Caught up in cost overruns and a corruption scandal, uh, construction was suspended indefinitely in 2010 after racking up a price tag of 200 million euro. And it is estimated that another 400 million would be required uh, to bring it to completion. That's probably not gonna happen anytime soon. In the meantime, it deteriorates a dramatic and incomplete addition to Rome's dispersed skyline. Fu and Rachelli, as we will learn tonight, are investigating this contemporary ruin for the question it raises about completion and the degree to which buildings can allow for varied and adaptive relationships uh, to weather. After the last few weeks in which the south of Italy received unprecedented amounts of snowfall without a flake until a couple of days ago uh, to be seen in the Dolomites, a, a reversal of uh, traditional notions of, of climate in this country, the title of their talk, Can You Believe the Weather We Are Having? And the imperative design thinking to learn from weather patterns seems more relevant than ever. Please join me in uh, welcoming Modu to the platform.
Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Peter, um, for the really generous introduction. And thank you to everyone and so many familiar faces for coming. Um, we also obviously want to thank the Academy because we wouldn't be here without the Academy. Um, and to countless fellows and fellow travelers who we have inundated in the past four months with really strange questions, um, seemingly random, but hopefully you will see the product of some of it tonight. Things like, what do you think the weather was like in the, in the, in the 1700s? <laughs> Um, so we uh, created these photo essays for you, which we're not going to talk about, and we forgot to thank all the shoe models. Thank you. You know who you are. Um, so you, and you probably ask yourself, uh, wondering why these architects are showing images that have nothing to do with architecture um, and taking pictures of your feet. Um, so for us, we look at architecture as a medium uh, that connects environment and people. We look below, above, far and close. Uh, this diagram, which we love, which represents a narrative of a structure of a, no a narrative structure of a novel, for us describe what we're trying to do, uh, going in loops, going away from architecture, looking at something else, coming back, redefining what is architecture. It's also a, a way of a timeline, time as a tool, not only going backward or forward, but actually intervening in the past uh, to create alternate uh, futures. Uh, we look at durations. For us, a duration can be a moment, um, a moment, uh, an hour, uh, a year, a decade. So Raquel and I also have had um, kind of circuitous paths to get to where um, to where we are. Um, Raquel was born in Tel Aviv. I was born in Saigon. Um, we've come to Rome for one incredible year, um, but our architecture practice remains based in New York. Um, so we essentially come from two different climate types, one the uh, tropical wet and dry, the other Mediterranean, and most likely the only place that these two climate types can come to, together and meet is in New York City. But this map is, is more than about our different backgrounds. It's actually a map of our weather memories, and we're uh, convinced that this, these memories that we have from our, our kind of um, childhood inform a lot of our thinking about weather and architecture and a lot of our questioning about it. Climate change is undeniable. Um, so the, the, the role of this lecture is not to kind of prove climate change, but actually to start asking some questions about how can we as architects use our greatest asset, which is concepts. Um, how can we use concepts in the discipline of architecture to alter the public perception about the urgency of climate change. Um, so one of the things that we um, d do is we, we, we kind of explore this question about the temporal differences between weather and climate, that they are different in, in very specific ways, weather being immediate and experienced, uh, climate being longer term, more abstract, um, unfortunately more easily politicized because of this ab abstraction. Um, to rethink architecture's relationship to the environment. If, ar if architecture were more adaptable to the weather, then it would naturally have more of an impact on climate and climate change. Um, throughout our work, and we'll show you a different project, uh, we look at architecture, again, as, as a mediator that connects people, engages communities uh, with the environment. In our design, instead of creating clear boundaries uh, creating sealed uh, entities, controlled environments, we propose a range. Um, basically, creating um, permeable weather, permeable spaces for weather and people to connect, uh, spaces that are both urban and interior at the same time, uh, that, shift, that shift from com uh, universal comfort level to microclimates. Uh, transforming uncontrollability of weather with unpredictability of events uh, to create scenarios, multiple scenarios that never repeat themselves. When architecture and environment work together simultaneously, even mutating into one entity, creating dynamic relationships that are ever changing, never repeating between people, architecture, and weather. So this is a pretty simple uh, image, uh, but a very important one to us. 
in the simplest way, it's a key or a legend to our weather drawings um, to indicate um, what the, how we are developing a kind of um, drawing language of, of, drawing, of how we represent um, the invisible. But more importantly, it's a kind of lexicon. It's a lexicon of hybrid forms of architecture and weather, um, probably most evident with things like a wall of air or an air curtain. These drawings show mutations, not only between architecture and weather, but also between the opposing scales of the built environment, between interior spaces and um, urban. Um, we call these, this kind of uh, mutation, we, we, we call them either uh, indoor cities or conversely, urban, uh, urban interiors. We practice this active design of environments in programs that mediate rather than separate from weather. And what we're designing for is the intersection of weather and social interaction. We consider our projects as designers to be incomplete when we're done with them, but that they only become completed once the weather and, and, and people um, intersect in the projects. Um, so we're going to show um, a series of projects. So, um, the projects are both from uh, before um, uh, we came to Rome from our practice, as well as a series of been doing in Rome. And the idea, it's important I think to, to say at this point, it's a, the idea is not to show how um, you know, our work in Rome is informed by our previous work, but actually perhaps the inverse, that Rome has made possible because it's a lens for us, a rereading of our past work. Um, so using um, perhaps, you know, the, the, a present to um, rethink the, the past or vice versa. So our um, first met weather memory coming to Rome was the constantly changing Roman sky. Um, the clouds have this incredible character, especially when we first came in the fall, um, and, you know, it captivated us. So what we did um, was we recorded every single day for a two-hour segment from our, from our studio, um, the clouds, quite simply. Um, we were probably the only people uh, in the academy who woke up and was happy to see clouds. Um, the clouds were first classified in the early 1800s by Luke Howard, who was actually the father of modern meteorology and first to identify the urban heat island effect. Weather up until that point was typically thought of as just a picturesque image, but his classification system, which learned from other natural systems, introduced both space and time. So similarly, our time-lapse videos are showing weather changes over time, not the kind of instant uh, image you get when you look out the window, but the um, experience you get throughout a day, um, things that are perhaps more invisible, wind speed, air pollution, or visibility. And these otherwise invisible characteristics, characteristics of weather are essential, much more than just the temperature, but weather is experienced with multiple senses and viewing the weather on one day, four days, or 16 days changes one's perception. So um, these are the images from the 16 days. And here, the different, we, we notice the difference between the air and the atmosphere, which is the upper line, the top third, and in the bi biosphere, the bottom third. Um, this is the issue of air quality, which is a significant issue in Rome as shown by the haze that exists above the city um, on most days. The color value of the atmosphere, and this is, would be the, each one of the 16 days that we, that we um, showed, um, the color values of the atmosphere are reflected in the daily weather report. The color values of the biosphere, and this is the kind of grayish, kind of brownish colors that, that happen up directly above the city, are um, the color values of the biosphere are reflected in the air quality reports. And the color of air depends on whether you're looking at the atmosphere or the biosphere. Both are part of the weather. Taking these together, the average sky is this. This is the color value of taking all of the RGB values from each of those days and creating a median value. This is what you experience over a month. If the daily sky color from the previous images is weather, then this is climate. And the difference between atmosphere and biosphere, as well as weather and climate, is intuitively experienced, but rarely visualized. This question of how to represent weather as a sensorial experience is not new. 
um, it's probably most evident in the very well-known drawings by Piranesi, The Views of Rome. And it's at this time in the 1700s that there is a kind of profound interest in the relationship between society and environment. And these drawings, one could say, is perhaps a product of, of the zeitgeist at the time. The various states of Rome, of, of, of these drawings, um, were drawings that occurred over a 20-year process. So they were not done and completed, but actually he would go back to the drawings. This is a close-up of one of the copper engravings. He would go back over a 20-year period, and um, for the most part, mo almost all the changes he would make would be either to the sky to increase contrast in the sky or to the ground to increase shadow. He's basically... Um, not making any changes to the architecture, right? So what the engravings show, we think, is that Piranesi is, is modifying the sensorial atmosphere of the drawings by manipulating the meteorological atmosphere, the weather. And at the t if you consider that at the time, in the 1750s to 1780s, this is the end of the Little Ice Age, that there's very extreme weather. Basically, it's coming out of a few hundred years of very cold uh, weather across Europe, and that the, the weather was changing rapidly and um, almost, um, um, you know, very violently. Um, so, you know, this was an interesting question for us. Like, is, similar to what we were doing um, here, was Piranesi um, also drawing, trying to draw climate change? These manipulations that we are doing to these drawings, um, removing the buildings, as Rickelli said, um, architects not looking at architecture, um, making an incomplete drawing from a completed one, is in the end a hybrid drawing that connects the two kinds of atmospheres that we're interested in. I'll present Outdoor Room, a project we designed uh, in an Olympic uh, park in Beijing post the Olympics. So it's basically a huge um, abandoned kind of infrastructure in the city uh, with a different scale. Um, when you go to Beijing, uh, first thing you notice are uh, the smog, which is basically harmful particles that once accumulated become visible and create a change in the color of the skies. Um, and the different color represent different um, health hazard. Um, and our idea was to create a room in a city, a single room in a city, and a city in a room. Uh, a room with a window uh, to allow views for the Olympic um, landmarks. A room which is always open, inviting people to enter, to stop, to uh, pass by. A room that is not completely enclosed, a room that allows the city to appear and disappear, a barometer of air pollution levels, um, where in a place where data was not accessible for the public, pollution become an interior partition. We specify, we specify architectural material and architecture fabric uh, that is uh, both translucent and reflective, basically uh, created a uh, um, um, It uh, adopts completely the color of the sky that day, making the room itself appear and disappear with um, the level of air pollution. <coughs> program, we architects talk about it a lot, but what is program in architecture? Um, Program is a set of actions or events that happens in a space. Um, those events are either um, planned or unplanned. Uh, for instance, um, space for archiving, where someone uh, may be trying to make a private call with his iPhone. Um, um, a reading area, where you may think that you eat a sandwich without being noticed. Um, or a lounge, when you just take a five-minute nap we uh, propose to look at it a little bit differently. Uh, instead of having programs that are, have a fixed definition, a fixed timeline, uh, we would like to introduce um, basically the idea of thermodynamic to, uh, to thermodynamic and, thermo and, and, and social dynamic as a way to define spaces. For instance, instead of saying I'm going um, 
um, for to the archive, I can say I'm, I'd like to um, go and have um, a, um, a space that is warm with strong light, and I can converse converse there with Paris Hilton, or a place myself and it's cool and quiet and I can manage my migraine. Um, so allowing to open up a definition of a space that can be um, appropriate later on with the changes that a building um, takes. Uh, looking back at Noli, um, Noli maps of Rome. Um, okay, I thought it was upside down, but it's good. Um, looking back at, at the Noli we are excited about the idea of Denali, though it presented as black and white, right? As um, private, black, white is public. What actually interesting about it is that it, um, the white also includes um, interior spaces, right? So public, through Denali's eyes, was not just about a public which is outside, but you rethink about this a relationship of public versus private and <coughs> public private and public, interior and exterior. For us, um, it basically creates some sort of a social um, topography, a topography where it can show where the public can go and celebrate and create different, um, basically, interactions. Uh, we'd like to add to it the lens of thermodynamic. And this is a scenario that happens in the summertime where you can see all the diverse um, climate that occur. Either the hottest places uh, that we imagine are in the street versus the cooler gardens to the most cool uh, interior spaces that through the thermal mass create a cool a kind of shelter from a hot city. Um, and so reimagining and actually uh, looking at how he used to look at the city um, and in a way avoid the contemporary situation of not accessing interior spaces or very limited access to those interior spaces. We propose our own city, <laughs> future city, where the black and the white are both interior and exterior. Uh, we redistribute and repurpose elements that are both urban and interior. Uh, we call them urban corridors or interior streets urban rooms and interior piazzas. A city that exchanges between thermodynamic and social flows. A, th a city that is both micro and urban at the same time. Okay. Um, so this is a project we proposed again in China. <laughs> Uh, in Rushang, uh, which is a mid-sized city, um, basically a regional center designed from Tabula Rasa uh, to fight the mass immigration from um, villages to the large metropolitans. Um, and basically we took elements that are both interior and from the city. So we have a building, we have a garden, and we have a piazza or a square. We look at uh, playing um, or play garden in the most literal sense of having both. Doing so by, again, working with microclimates. So in different ways, we are different ways, different weather, microclimates change and create the diversification of spaces, of interactions. Promoting free play uh, with Promoting free, um, sorry, promoting free play with a variety of microclimates while keeping open spaces as, as big as possible. Um, promoting visual and physical, uh, promoting visual and physical connections, um, creating barriers that are not seen but felt, uh, partitions um, that changes through different um, weather conditions, allowing for separation and connection between people, age groups, um, and etc. We use environmental strategies to design environments. For instance, we're creating a roof, we're collecting uh, water in the roof. Um, Interior-wise, it creates um, spaces that with 
uh, planning of where the light comes through. It creates um, very soft light and uh, interior atmosphere. We're designing, um, we're designing uh, for instance, the water system to irrigate um, the garden, to um, use as gray waters. Uh, we use um, basically a, um, a ceiling that, um, a chilled ceiling system, which is basically a thermodynamic surface to distribute uh, the heat in the building in a way that create those microclimates. Um, and we create um, thermal mass by thick walls, carving windows that are very deep and create a space location by itself. We ask ourselves, should we or are we going to design for basically one scenario, one client, or should we instead specify um, specify other properties, air properties, and social properties, instead of specifying a space and call it a library, a bedroom, an office, should we just specify light quality, temperature, humidity, um, echo levels, air velocity, um, levels of socializing, what else, Jeff? <laughs> So um, thermodynamics, um, it's a term that um, we've obviously used a lot so far. Um, <clears throat> and what the basic idea is that you know, the human body is already a thermodynamic system, and it cools itself by regulating exchanges of heat energy. Similarly, buildings have an exchange of heat energy from higher temperature to lower temperature and visibly occurring in the air. The human body, however, has an additional advantage that is both a thermal as well as a socially dynamic system that is based on the senses. And this, really, oops, and this relationship is one that has been fascinating us here, which is that thermodynamics and social dynamics intersect in the public realm, and that perhaps um, thermodynamic urban spaces can also activate social interaction. Or maybe you know it's a little bit extreme to show that you may be holding hands with strangers, but, so um, when we came here, the piazzas in Rome fascinated us, and, and more than just the ability to just kind of lounge there all day. Um, they are interconnected voids in the city. You never experience a piazza by itself, but it's a network of urban rooms, one after the other, that allow for, um, within, invisibly allow for the macro flow of heat from cool to warm region, or from warm to cool regions, shown in the top image with the area uh, in shade and, and outside of shade, um, as well as microflows between materials with different thermal capacities. Um, <clears throat> the image on the bottom, you can see a cobblestone that's outside of the surface of the, that's not embedded within the street and how it has a higher um, temperature than the, the cobblestones that are in the street. Similarly, the bottom image here are um, different thermal capacities of materials. Um, the metal panel is um, able to absorb heat higher and transfers that heat to the stone, um, as you can see from the left to the right of the image. So we took these images. We did a series of drawings. Um, we took thermal photography from, of the, of the uh, piazzas um, and then transferred them into what we call thermodynamic drawings. Um, the drawing is shown on the bottom. It's about 20 feet long. We've done a couple of them. Um, this one is in, in, is in Trastevere. It's Piazza di Santa Maria to Largo San Giovanni. Um, but what we're doing with them is trying to show how from the thermal image you can get thermodynamic um, information in a drawing, that they are exchanges shown from source, thermal source to thermal sink. Um, and in the winter, people cluster in groups according to the sun patterns in summer groups uh, cluster in the shade. People in, in the city or the, the materials of the city are shown the same if they had the same temperature range. So in this image from 1030 to 230, you can see that um, the people here are outlined in, um, uh, with, with a kind of black outline, um, that uh, in the afternoon people start to congregate together and that as they, um, strangers who do not know each other are close enough to be perceived as together. So some of the questions that we're thinking with this work is how can the design of thermodynamic urban spaces prompt more social dynamics? Or conversely, can the public modify the microclimates around them to create their own social dynamics? 
this project was a, a pavilion that we designed for a plaza um, for the um, for the National Design Museum in in, in Israel. Um, the plaza is hot, extremely hot, um, and unused. Um, as you can see here, it's like there's absolutely no shade in the plaza. Um, and so what we did was we created a system that was made of balls, lightweight hollow balls, um, that would move across the ceiling. Um, it created a kind of flat landscape that was suspended in the air, changing every day, ex especially in the afternoon in the Mediterranean as the wind would come from the west. The wind forces would move these balls freely, but also because we chose three different sizes to the balls, they didn't lock themselves into a grid. So that basically that kind of um, promoted this idea of free, free movement, um, uncontrolled movement in a way. <coughs> so here we're talking again about thermodynamics activating social dynamics. The overhead movement allows for public events to occur in different areas of the pavilion, connecting its so cultural and social programs to constantly changing forces of weather. So it's a pretty simple system. It's, um, we borrow from the kind of vernacular of the, um, the agricultural greenhouses are throughout Israel. Um, and we remove all of the kind of enclosure around the greenhouse, taking off the roof, the walls, and instead adding a new enclosure, which is a very, very flat ceiling. One of the kind of biggest challenges of building it was to make sure that they build it so it's totally flat and the 30,000 balls don't just roll down to one side. Um, so that took, you know, considering that we, that we do these projects um, while based in New York, it's a, there's a lot of nights in which we're just waiting for the next morning's uh, uh, updates. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the way it works is that the balls move freely on a surface that is a kind of um, um, structural, not structural, but like a metal mesh, um, and the wind moves between the balls but also through the surface. Um, and there's a lot of kind of unexpected mo moments that you just, we, we ourselves never can predict when we design these kind of projects. Um, I think it's the, in a way the, 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 the idea of the uncontrolled. Um, and that, uh, that there's a kind of surprise element to them. Um, but much of the, the idea of this is that when you come back to this from day to day, that there's different places where the balls end up creating different areas of shade, creating different public programs. So the experience of this and much of our attitude about building in the public realm is to how can you create architecture that actually varies from one visit to another. Um, so the project is designed as um, incomplete, um, and that's that's a kind of purposeful strategy that we have, which is that um, the social interaction mobilized by weather is what would complete the project. There's a kind of emptiness to it um, when it's completed uh, or when it's built, but um, uh, it get, becomes activated not by us as the designers, but actually by the public and by the environment. Um, so here there's... Um, all sorts of kind of public programs um, it, that was organized by both the museum and by the city. Um, performances, uh, there was kind of outdoor um, uh, yoga class. Um, you can read a book from the loan library, uh, a book loan library from one, the, one of the nearby museums, or simply just to fetch a ball. And we also imagine for our projects the alternative program scenarios that what if it is not designed for this fixed program, but actually designed for other programs based off of the weather conditions, light or uh, wind, um, and it, what if it were a bookstore or a house. So the idea is that rather than um, uh, uh, ar architecture that modifies the weather, it's actually weather modifying architecture. So we've been doing a, a series of uh, workshops with um, um, uh, over a couple year period with a university in Sydney. Um, and the workshops basically ask the question of 
much of our work is about um, whether that modifies some kind of enclosure or something lightweight, like the balls. But what if w the weather actually modified structure? So um, with the kind of this generous support from this university, um, we've been working with carbon fiber with a group of students um, and collaborating with a professor there, Billy Furman. Um, and the, the, the idea is to create structures that actually, instead of being designed to be heavy and to resist the wind force, actually flexes. So carbon fiber has the highest strength to weight ratio of any structural material um, available. Um, and we, we are using this material to actually test, the ide test these ideas. It's, it's um, right now, like this project, which was last year's, um, is a very small pavilion. The idea is that it actually arrives to the site as two uh, mm, sphere, not spheres, but two hoops. Um, they lock it together and they pop it up, um, creating a kind of um, a modular um, structure. We love drones. <laughs> okay, so the last two projects. Um, this one is a project um, that's, um, <coughs> we were approached by a client. Um, he, there's a, um, a, I can't say where it is, but <laughs> there's a, um, an abandoned site um, on the waterfront. Um, and uh, the site had been previously used to build uh, yachts. Um, so there's basically a kind of yacht building factory with um, a, a boat loading dock you can kind of see in the aerial view that's a concrete slab that's about a foot thick. Um, so we knew those are, are two existing conditions um, that, we, that we deal with. It's abandoned for many years. Um, and he wanted to, to build here a, a manufacturing facility, a mixed-use manufacturing facility for um, uh, the, the um, um, green green uh, building panels. Um, and the challenge to this is that this kind of product needs to be made in extremely controlled, dust-proof um, conditions, um, which we don't have. Um, so the typical strategy for something like this would be when you w need clean room environment, you do a kind of concentric onion, right? So the innermost area is the most protected. That is the clean room. And as you kind of separate further and further out, then um, it becomes, quote unquote, more dirty and dirtier. But this is not ideal for, programmatically, for, for a building that is meant to foster different kinds of exchanges. Um, so we come up with this diagram, which is a kind of intersecting uh, onion. The building is mixed use. Um, so it has manufacturing, um, education, exhibition, and office programs. And what we wanted to do is to allow for visual connection between the different building in order to, um, but also allow, you still maintain the, the, the air separation between the different areas. So these drawings are kind of showing the different zones um, which are separated. And the way that we do this is to take air curtains, which probably everyone has experienced. It's really a basic um, mechanical system. They're often above the door of the, gro of the grocery store, the supermarket as you enter. Basically, it's a, a high-velocity jet of air that separates one zone from, a, from another. We propose using them at an industrial scale much larger than, um, well, that we have seen anyone. But uh, basically, at a scale in which they become invisible walls. And um, the idea is that these air curtains would allow for total connection and visual connection through the space, but also for separation. So this would be a dirty zone going into a cleaner room or in, into a cleaner area and beyond is the clean room itself. So there would be, as you move from one zone to another, it's like moving from one weather uh, condition to another um, invisibly. Um, each one would have its own thermal um, uh, requirements as well as air quality. So it's a, you would also, there's obviously a large amount of energy savings because you don't have to heat and cool this entire space, which the, 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 eight, the, the main hall is um, the size of the turbine hall in, in Tate Modern. Um, so the, these drawings show this kind of a strategy of both connection and separation um, uh, using also simulation software to, to, um, to kind of check check the work. The site outside, the large boat dock, um, that whole site had been damaged heavily um, by Hurricane Sandy. And um, part of our strategy was to design um, an environment keeping the boat, the boat loading dock 
um, that would help for f um, basically the any, any kind of excess rain that would happen. And the chances of it are high because of the large amount of concrete slab there. So um, we designed a kind of island, uh, an island and land, which um, would allow for people to have a, a quiet place to eat lunch, read a book. Um, but as well, underneath that island is a very large cistern. And through the concrete slabs, we would be cutting trenches that would allow rain to basically route into the in, uh, into the below the island into the cistern, so the water would be used to to irrigate that that area. Um, so after this all introduction to the contemporary ruins in Rome, um, I think that um, Peter did a good job of describing uh, the Città della Sport and um, uh, the difficulties of imagining a new future to it. But we propose with this movie um, new reading. A bird watching hide. An indoor rain. A Roman fountain. An open enclosure. Dry pools. Indoor city. Panoramic window. An artificial mountain. A monument without a city. An interior park. A cloud room. An air quality index. Thank you. Thank you. Not ideal. I knew you would ask that a question, Jonathan. <laughs> um, but it's a you know it's a something that you would you we've proposed that before. Um, also, actually, for an auditorium, um, I think it depends on the program, you know, because they don't make a huge amount of noise, but they also obviously let a lot of noise pass through, right? So, um, the rooms that require acoustic separation have, are enclosed, basically.
quite a mystery, uh, requires a lot of debate. <laughs> um, um, I think the drawings, if we showed you how we draw, which is maybe is not a typical a classical way of drawing architecture, I think the drawings take us there. Um, and then I think a lot of, um, I think we're thinking about the macro, but also the, the smallest detail is as important as the macro concept to figure out that detail, right? Um, the essence, um, to make something completely disappear or the most, um, to extract the element to the minimum of the minimum is something that we think a lot of. I think, I mean, I think also like our experience in Rome is a kind of microcosm of how, how um, convoluted our design process is, which is that being in Rome has allowed us to um, kind of resuscitate ideas that we've talked about for many years. So things may have been in a conversation for a previous project or for um, a, a grant proposal or, you know, an article five years ago. Um, and um, they come back, right? So I think that also the work we do here we will be uh, regurgitating <laughs> for for a while, and it's not um, it's not a it's certainly I think that one thing that I want to say is that you know when you make a presentation like this, um, it's much more clear and organized than than it is in terms of in the studio. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it looks much more organized. <laughs> Good thing. I think as we show today, uh, in many cases, it's both. Um, we take data that is complex and um, kind of translate it to a physical experience on purpose. Um, it is subjective, but um, it is subjective. Each person um, feel differently, um, and, and that's fine. Uh, but as long as the awareness is there, that's the important part. I mean, I think the con yeah the contradiction also that you're pointing out, saying is productive. Like we usually look for those kind of, you know, you see it in some of the way that we are creating lexicons to speak about our work, right? So, um, a wall of air, or an indoor city. Those are contradictions. So the weather at a kind of macro level is both objective, meaning that it's universal. Everyone experiences the weather. Everyone can talk about it at any cocktail party. It's also subjective, right? So we have this whole body of research about how um, the term thermal comfort is a really subjective term, right? Depending on whether you're male or female, depending on your cultural background, right? So I think that the con that that friction that you're talking about is we good. we can't answer your question, but it's good. <laughs> Kim, you had a question. I, I don't think we design a space like that, but I've been to a space like that. So it is a memory, uh, as Fu says, weather memory. Um, um, I went uh, two hours from Tel Aviv. You go to the Negev Desert, um, and there is a field of dates. You cross the field, and you enter a cave-like, which is uh, a huge refrigerator to refrigerate the dates before they ship to the U.S. 70% of the dates in the U.S. are from Israel. 
Um, <laughs> you enter that space with coats and whatever there is to grab because it's freezing cold. So in one hand, you're in the desert, it's hot, right? You better have water in the car. And on the other hand, it's freezing cold. So we haven't designed it yet, but we would love to. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to do this kind of back and forth, but I think the questions are super interesting. So <laughs> I want to have my, my um, also my kind of outlook on that question. That's how we work, too. <laughs> There's a lot of talking. Um, the, I think the, one of the most difficult places, the most extreme places to design for weather-wise is a place like New York because it has very, very hot summers and very, very cold winters. So if it's always one temperature, it's actually a little bit easier to design for it. Um, so we come from this tradition. I mean, we both, you know, Raquel and both designed and built things in a lot of different climates, but in New York, it's very difficult. So, for example, we have this kind of map that we keep up, and it's like places we want to do projects for. We don't think about we want to do a stadium or we want to do this, but we, you know, like we're doing something in Sydney because we want to work in that climate. And similarly in Rome, like Rome for us is like, you know, like the all the piazza work, is, is a very specific condition, I think, basically, that you know, in early winter when it's not too cold and the sun is coming in really low, it creates this kind of social clustering that you wouldn't see in Washington Square Park because it's just cold, right? So um, I think that you know, like we're kind of enjoying that opportunity of working in, in different, ex different versions of climates than we normally do. <laughs> but this is also, oh my God. Because for me, what we do in the Pantheon, in the different moments of, 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 the, of the year, we also have to have different meteorological experience. And as everybody knows, not only to go and read Raphael or Edgar, but also to do other things like this. And everybody experiences that. So we can say that Pantheon is not only the most important single architecture in the experience of a human being, also from a meteorological point of view. That is really fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> now we have the second topic. The following. You show this crisis, huge crisis, that is the Calacada city of sports over there. And so when I was looking at your fantastic picture, unbelievable picture, you talk to you, Sir Joe, also, just incredible, congratulations. <laughs> We're in. <laughs> Thank you.